what is Baba not? There is nothing that isn't Baba. How isn't Baba? When isn't Baba? Where isn't Baba? Why isn't Baba? When I was listening to Swami, he taught me to listen to him with my heart and that in darshan he trained me over and over and over so that I would know when I was really hearing him was that I was looking at him with the third eye and I could feel the love for him in my heart. I had five near-death experiences before mm. the age of six. By the age of six I was really traumatized and I wanted to die. So Charles and Faith Penn were leading the 1987 Sai Baba retreat. And in that, uh, Charles had us do a meditation. In the meditation, I had a vision, which I, at that point I never had visions, completely never. It was uh, something completely foreign to me. But I had a very clear vision of Swami embracing me, like just holding me. And I soon realized that it wasn't me as I was at that age. It was me as I was at the age of six. And I knew with total certainty in that moment that it was Sai Baba who was God who had sent an angel to keep me from killing myself at the age of six. This mess that we're in, this apparent mess of this world, is just an opportunity to experience whatever we experience. You know, the Buddhists have a saying that uh, pain is inevitable, uh, but suffering is optional. Mm -hmm. Everything is a gift. There is nothing that isn't, but it takes a lot of tremendous amount of digging and deep work to reframe it as a gift and to, to understand how we grow from it. And sometimes we have to die before we can accept that gift. I finally prayed. I said, God, I don't know whether you exist or not. And if you exist, I don't know if you want to listen to me because I haven't believed in you and I haven't prayed to you for many years at this point. But if you exist and if you are listening, please at least let me know why I'm suffering. Within 24 hours of that prayer, I actually had a diagnosis. A unique life, one with many tests, pain, breakthroughs, and discovery especially spiritual discovery. This is the important story of Rosie Goldsmith, a licensed massage therapist from Portland, Oregon, and more importantly, a woman of deep spiritual connection to Holy Man Tree Satya Sai Baba. Welcome to Soul Church. This interview was recorded in Portland, Oregon in October 2012. Rosie Goldsmith, it's a pleasure to have you with Soul Church. You go back a good number of years with Holy Man Sri Satya Sai Baba. I guess the most logical place to start is the beginning. How did you first learn of him? I was in a study group for, see so you asked me a question that took me by <laughs> surprise, so well, give, give me just a second. Well, okay, and do you remember the year that might have been or approximately the year? Yeah, I'm going to start over. So okay. You're going to have to edit this out because it's, I wasn't prepared for that. So. How, let me just uh, feed no. you the question <clears throat> to you again. No, let's let, give me just a second. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. All right. Okay, Rosie, it's a delight to have you with Sojourns today, and I'm curious about the obvious. When you were first attracted to Sai Baba, the year maybe, and how that happened. Well, I first heard outwardly about Sai Baba in 1983. I was in a meditation group that had to do with Benjamin Krem and mm. a meditation group that, to bring peace to the world called Peace the 21st. And I heard about him in this group and I read an article in Benjamin Krem's Share International where Swami had written about the need of children all over the world, how desperate it was and how the first world wasn't attending to this incredible hunger. And I thought, wow, that guy has good politics. That was the first <laughs> thought I ever had about him. And then I heard somebody else in that group uh, had terrible pain in his back and you know had a spinal scoliosis and was just in excruciating pain and had heard about that Sai Baba was a healer. So he had a friend who was going to India 
and he asked him for something from Sai Baba for healing and he brought his friend brought back this vibhuti and he's going what is this powder I wanted healing <laughs> but I heard from somebody else in the group that Sai Baba was uh, the real guru a true guru a living you know example of what a guru was supposed to be and I just I didn't that was all I knew about him at that time and then I took a Reiki class, and, and then I took a first-degree uh, first Reiki, then I took a second-degree Reiki class. And in the first-degree Reiki class, I audited someone else's class. Mm -hmm. And this was a woman who was a follower of Yogananda. And she had the whole lineage of Yogananda. She was from SRF, Self-Realization mm -hmm. Fellowship. So she had pictures of the whole lineage, and this huge picture that was a photograph of a picture of Swami that where there was Vibhuti manifesting all over it. So it was a photograph of that. And so she, uh, she knew that I loved God, that I, you know, I had a passionate love of God. And she, she, in her meditation, got told that she needed to tell me that it was time for me to pray to God and ask who was to be my Satguru. And I said, what's a Satguru? I don't know that I like the sound of that. You know, I don't think people need gurus, you know, whatever that is. And she said, I'm not going to tell you the answer until you pray to God and ask who is to be your Satguru. So I had read Autobiography of a Yogi and I liked Yogananda and, you know, so I sat and prayed and I got the answer, Sai Baba. And I went, hmm, don't know too much about him. So I went into a deep meditation and I prayed again. And again, the answer came, Sai Baba. So I went into a long, deep meditation, and the answer came, Sai Baba. So he was pretty persistent. He had his fishing line out, and he knew he was going to hook you, even though your heart and your head had a, a, a budding allegiance to Yogananda. Or it was all I knew. So then she moved to Los Angeles, and by the time it was time for me to take my second degree Reiki, which was six months later, um, she's, you know, I knew I needed it because somebody needed some very profound healing that I was working with. And she said, I'll put together a class for you. And while you're here, would you like to go to, you know, the Hollywood and all the glamorous things? Or would you like to go to the Sai Baba bookstore? I said, well, if he's supposed to be my Sat Guru, I better go to the Sai Baba bookstore. The one in Tustin. Yeah. So I went down there and went in and Swami spoke to me and he said, this isn't going to be the last time I'm going to speak to you. Let me stop you right there because you've said that several times even before I turned the camera on. So obviously he has a history of guiding you and he guides you in a way that you refer to as he speaks to you. Mm -hmm. What was that first sensation like? Were you already accustomed to having maybe Yogananda or the Holy Spirit or some other teacher uh, speak to you in the past or was this brand new with Baba? I was used to having guidance in prayer and meditation. When I was a very small child, I loved to pray. You know, when my father, I was Jewish, when my father first taught me the Shema for nighttime, I would just, I loved it. I wanted him to teach me more prayers. He finally got me a book because I was so eager for prayers. He got me a book of, of um, uh, children's songs and prayers to God because I just loved praying to God. Well, this wasn't too common in my family. By the age of seven, I wanted to talk to God so badly that I now know it was Swami, but I didn't know it was then, taught me to meditate. Well, I didn't know, I, I didn't really know what meditation was. So at the age of seven, I would lie down on the top, I was in the upper bunk bed, I shared a bunk bed with my sister. And I would lie down and I would get very calm and I would let go of everything that was bothering me and everything in the day and I would just breathe. <coughs> and, you know, back at that time when you, when you went to a gas station, you know, the, the person who came up to pump your gas had a little name badge, okay. So, and I like to sit behind my father in the car. So, um, in this meditation that Swami gave me, I would be lying flat and I would be, my father would drive up or somebody, I was in the car and I would roll down the window and the gas station attendant would come and on his name badge it said God. God? God. <laughs> and I would talk to God because I wanted to talk to God so badly. This was a seven-year-old meditation. I can't 
take credit for it. It just is what came to me because I, I just wanted to talk to God. That was, you know, it was this deep, deep yearning. <laughs> and that must be a record for how young children could be coming to meditation. I mean, uh, I have no idea. It's just what happened to me. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go back to the Tustin bookstore. Here you are. Baba's guiding you. You're inside the store. Did he have you reach into your wallet and buy a book or two? And if so, um, do you remember the first book you bought? I don't remember any of that. Okay. All I remember was sitting in front of this picture and having this very deep experience. And uh, well, I remember a few funny things, but that's not not anything of, of that consequence. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have you reposition your microphone just a little bit. It's scratching up against the coat there. Just mm. put it on oh, your it fell over. Yeah, just put it on your zipper there. And while you're doing that, I want you to tell me and think about what the next logical step was, um, it sounds like Baba at this point was more in pursuit of you than you might have been in pursuit of Baba. Well, in Judaism there isn't a concept of God taking a human form. Mm -hmm. So it never would have occurred to me that he was really God. And I, you know, because I was called by him inwardly, and he was to be my sat guru. When I first came back to my Reiki master and told her, okay, now I've got an answer. What is a sat guru? She said, the sat guru is the one who leads you to your enlightenment. So the first question I asked about Swami was, I, and then I said, well, how do you know if you get a true answer? She said, well, he's got to be enlightened himself, <laughs> he or she. And I said, is Sai Baba enlightened? <laughs> I know, no. it's so funny. So. I went to my first Sai Baba retreat in the Pacific Northwest um, that was led by, this you're going to have to edit out too. Okay. I'm having a little memory Well, there, there, there are various people who seem to come back there a lot. You're talking about the Wilma Bronke retreat or another no. Sai Center retreat? It was in the Pacific Northwest region and it was... Uh, Charles Penn. Okay. Charles and Faith Penn. Never okay. had the privilege oh, okay. to meet him. So Charles and Faith Penn were leading the 1987 Sai Baba retreat, and in that, <coughs> and in that, uh, Charles had us do a meditation. In the meditation, I had a vision, which I, at that point I never had visions. Completely never. It was uh, something completely foreign to me. But I had a very clear vision of Swami embracing me, like just holding me. And I soon realized that it wasn't me as I was at that age. It was me as I was at the age of six. And I knew with total certainty in that moment that it was Sai Baba who was God who had sent an angel to keep me from killing myself at the age of six. Because I had never told another human being about that. And there was nobody who even knew. And so that was, that was like a very deep experience for me, because then I knew that he was God. You are mentioning that to us, uh, even though you didn't share it with anybody else. So I presume um, it's okay if I ask you what the circumstances might have been around such an awful thought for such an awfully young child. Um, I was, I had very, um, I had very early childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. I had a good family, but very severe trauma. And, you know, one of the things that Mother Bronchi, Wilma Bronchi, taught us is that we choose our parents. People have a funny concept of karma, that it's the suffering that we engage in, but truly we choose our circumstances of our life because that's the spiritual path that we must follow in order to reach God. So for me, I had a lot of intense suffering and trauma. I had five near-death experiences before mm. the age of six. By the age of six, I was really traumatized and I wanted to die. So I wasn't, you know, I was six years old, so I wanted to die. I tried to drown myself. That didn't work. Uh, you know, there was a big patch of poison ivy, so I thought it was going to be poisonous, and I rolled around in it, 
and it didn't kill me. You're but still it, here. It kept my mother up many nights <laughs> putting cold compresses on me because I had a very severe case of poison ivy. And then I saw this stuff underneath the sink that had a skull and crossbones mm -hmm. that my mother said was poison. So I tasted a little bit of it and it tasted okay. So I had made up my mind I was just going to drink it. And this angel appeared to me in my bedroom. And it was, he took up, there was, it was a wall that was an inner wall. And so there was no window there, but a window appeared. And this man appeared in a robe and he was in a meadow, so I could see flowers behind him, and he started talking to me. And uh, he asked me questions that were very deep, profound questions. First he said that he was an angel sent by God. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he said, you know, do you love your parents? Yes. Do your parents love you? Yes. And so then he would ask <coughs> that about each of, he would ask that about each of my brothers and my sister. And then he said, how would your sister feel if you weren't here anymore? And asked, how would your brothers feel? And then he said, how would your parents feel if you weren't here anymore? And I was turning deeply to answer that and I just started talking and my little sister walked into the room and she said, who are you talking to? And I said, that little man over there and he was gone. Now you said this was, you described it as a vision. You weren't sleeping, it wasn't a dream in the middle of the night. This is at the time you were considering actually drinking this poison. Yeah, I was six, it wasn't a vision, I saw him. It was, so for you it was a real experience? It was very real, I never told anyone because it, it really changed a lot of things. For me to reflect on the suffering that would happen to somebody else if I committed suicide at the age of six, by asking me, he just asked these really questions that for me were very deep questions. And know. very and, and very important questions because a six-year-old might say to herself, I don't want to bring pain and suffering to my siblings. Right. And that logic worked apparently that he yeah. brought to you. Right. And did you ever make a connection as to your attraction to Sai Baba and this angel, this man later in years? Did you ever think that that was the incident that I just mm -hmm. told you about with Charles Penn having us do the meditation. Okay. That was the that was the connection. Immediately I knew when I saw that he was embracing me at the age of six, I knew that he was God. He was the one who had sent the angel. It was totally obvious because I had never told anyone about that. You know, I think a lot of people, I think you're touching on something extremely important because a lot of people come to Baba for <laughs> whatever the reason and whatever the modality mm -hmm. and they start to talk about their life with Baba from that moment forward. Mm. When some people, not too many, start looking back in years before they even heard Sai Baba's name or saw his form in a photograph, and they start connecting the dots about early childhood or young adult spiritual experiences of a profound nature such as the one you're describing here. Mm -hmm. I've had that feeling myself that my path was set for me on various levels through wonderful periods and painful periods by a divine inspiration, a thought, a teacher who knew what was happening to me would be in my highest and best good. But of course, I wouldn't know that at the time until I came through a lot of this. And then upon discovering Sai Baba in my life, it was easier to start really linking my current day knowledge to my previous life events. Not previous life, but earlier life events. And you did that because of that meditation, mm -hmm. and not just because Charles Penn instructed you on in the meditation, but because of the stark, incredible image that came to you in that meditation. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about how... Uh, Swami is with all of us all the time. There's never a separation. There never is, there never was, there never will be. We can't. We have the experience as if we're separate from God. But it's part of His play that we believe that we're separate, that we believe that there is a Ted and a Rosie, and mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, we seem to inhabit separate bodies, but who we really are is not these bodies. And so there is never a time that God is not with us, that Swami is not with us, ever. That mm -hmm. must sound so foreign to people who not only know you but love you because 
they gave you your life. Your, in other words, your parents, siblings, and relatives, much like my parents, my siblings, my relatives, my own children, they, they don't quite get that huge element of oneness, of what Baba would call Advaita, of that there is only God. That's a very diff difficult concept for people, I think, to even accept, to debate in the West, let alone accept fully. How did you come to that? Very interesting. At the age of five or six, I developed a very severe case of psoriasis mm. that I had through many years. By the age of maybe 14 or 15, I'd given up on God because every birthday, that was my birthday wish, and every prayer I ever had, Feel. I was so miserable. It was so, and it was as, I, I was, I looked like I had the plague. I mean, I looked hideous. I was very disfigured. I was tormented in school. That's part of why at the age of seven I wanted to oh, talk to sure, God, you yeah, know. Yeah. And I, you know, when our family lived in Geneva, Switzerland, I wanted the quick and simple solution instead of the very painful treatment that they had for psoriasis, <coughs> uh, which I had just experienced a little of, which was corticosteroids. So they used way too much of it and my skin became paper thin, very mm. thin. By the time we came back to the States, um, and I went to college here in Portland, Reed College. Um, the doctors gave me at that time what was the most commonly prescribed treatment for psoriasis. Uh, it was the most, for, for people with psoriasis, and it was also the active ingredient in the over-the-counter preparation. I didn't know that that was the cause of my suffering at that point, but I started having severe memory loss and sensory loss and uh, very impaired judgment, and extremely confused. And within two years of using that medication, I had no memory of my childhood. I had total mm. amnesia. I had very little speech abilities. I had possibly the grammar of a three-year-old. Um, from somebody who had been very brilliant as a child and who was attending Reed College, which is a very prestigious college, you have to be pretty smart to get into it. I could count up to five, but not more. I didn't know any numbers past five. I could add one plus one, mm. but I couldn't add two plus two. I had no, uh, I, I was, I had what, um, I had what they call in, um, when people have had strokes, uh, aphasia, mm -hmm. which is the inability to express things verbally, and the words would get mixed up. So I had both expressive aphasia and receptive aphasia. So if somebody said something to me, my ability to understand what they said, their words would be garbled or distorted or be completely other words than what they said. So, and then I started going blind and deaf. Um, the, my visual field would just turn, it would just be gone. and. I had no sensation in my hands. I had trouble walking. I was stumbling. I couldn't grip objects. I couldn't drive anymore. And uh, I had no memory. So it was like being a student at Reed College was not really working very well. And at that time, now I told you about the age of maybe 15, I had given up on God. Mm -hmm. So by this, might be 14. Uh, at this point, I was. Uh, 19, mm -hmm. and I was in really bad shape, really bad, and I was going in and out of really psychotic episodes. Mm -hmm. I, at that time, started believing that I was from another planet because I had no memory at all of having grown up here, so I thought I was a, what do they call it, a drop-in or mm -hmm. something, you know, just because I thought, I don't, I couldn't speak English, I couldn't understand what people said to me, I couldn't articulate anything. Um, and I finally prayed. And I prayed a very strange prayer. I said, God, I don't know whether you exist or not. And if you exist, I don't know if you want to listen to me because I haven't believed in you and I haven't prayed to you for many years at this point. 
But if you exist and if you are listening, please at least let me know why I'm suffering. Within 24 hours of that prayer, I actually had a diagnosis. Now that prayer took place on New Year's Eve. So you know that medical offices aren't open on New Year's Eve. Sure. But as a result of that prayer, I, I, wanted, I, I said something to one of my housemates who said, you need to see a doctor. And I said, what kind of doctor? Because I didn't know one doctor mm -hmm. from another. And they said, I don't know. So I called my father, who was a medical doctor, and he was gone at a conference. And so I called, my mother called down to the conference and they paged him and he called back and he said, because I described that my hands were numb and I had this terrible taste in my mouth. I was brushing my teeth five times a day because I couldn't get rid of it. He said, you need to see a neurologist. And so he gave me the name of someone he knew. So I called that office and the secretary this is New Year's Eve, remind mm -hmm. you, okay. The secretary happened to come in because she'd forgotten a paper at the time that my phone rang. She was only in the office for mm -hmm. 10 minutes. She picked up the phone and she decided it sounded serious enough that she called the doctor who was a mm -hmm. um, doctor who was, who was, you know, not in the office. Mm -hmm. And the doctor's husband answered the phone and he said that the doctor was on her skiing <coughs> vacation. She was... And so, but he decided it sounded serious enough that he had her paged. So by the next day, this took 24 hours, she called back from the ski slopes. And I told her the symptoms and she said, you need to come to my office. And I didn't know how to get there and she described it and I said, oh, I'm going up there. I'm going to the dermatology clinic. I know how to get there. And she said, oh, what are you going there for? I said, psoriasis. She said, what are you using on the psoriasis? So I got open the jar and I read it to her, ammoniated mercury, and she said, stop using that right now, come into my office Monday. So I did, and by the time I was diagnosed, it was determined that I had 275 times the toxic level mm. of mercury in my urine from this medication. Uh, which is, uh, the toxic level at that time was five times what it is now, so it's 1,300 mm -hmm. something or other times the <coughs> current toxic level, which from all the literature I've read is higher than anyone who survived mercury poisoning. I was having so many severe disturbances, like not having normal sleep or dreams or anything. I talked to someone who said, you know, my brain was really shutting down and I was probably within two weeks of death. The really significant thing to me at that point was that I knew that God had existed and had heard my prayer. You got immediate help. It was so clear that God existed. I never, it the was- The most unlikely time of the year. It was just, God existed. I, you know, at that point I had been suffering so terribly, I couldn't even put it together. Um, and um, they said I had too much mercury in me in order to do a, um, chelation uh, and um, mercury has a half-life of about 70 days so it was almost two years before I was down to what they considered the toxic level below the toxic level. So this was the beginning of your turnaround this both was physically and spiritually. Yes and it was you know what really would set my <coughs> entire adult life so you're asking your the question that you asked was mm -hmm. how do you know the omnipresence, the constant mm -hmm. presence of God. It's a strange thing to have that much brain damage and to know the pres that God is there. That kind of brain damage, you know what, uh, you know, Alice in Wonderland through the looking mm -hmm. glass, you know, the sure. Mad Hatter, have oh, you yeah. heard of the Mad Hatter? Let me have. Hatters in 19th century England were all mad that's why it was called the Mad Hatter, they were insane because they used mercury to make the felts for their hat. So they were all insane from mercury poisoning. And the way they spoke at that, you know, at the Mad Hatter's tea party, that's how I was speaking. I wasn't really capable of speaking normally. And it's a kind of schizophrenia. So mm -hmm. this is a drug-induced schizophrenia. I had no sense of 
what ordinary people think of as ego. There was no sense of boundaries of who I was. Somebody would ask, you know, after this, if I wanted to go to a movie, and it was like finding an I that could have a want was just, I would look around. There was no way that I could answer that question. It was a totally ridiculous question your, to me. In, in and so over the years, that sense of I and wanting and sense you know, I would have an awareness maybe of what other people needed or, you know, extreme emotional stuff. But I knew that I wasn't normal. There's a lot of things that happen with massive brain damage that it's very hard for other people to understand. There's a lot of deficits. And so mostly I felt I was defective, mm -hmm. severely defective. And I suffered terribly. It was hard to recover. And I used to pray all the time, please God, please let this suffering not be in vain. Please let it not be wasted. Please let me turn it into a way of being service, mm -hmm. of being of service to others. Working, uh, being functional in the world was extremely difficult for me. It was so hard for me to focus or to remember anything, or if I got distracted, to remember the least bit of what I was doing before. And I complained once to my father, this was soon after the initial diagnosis, and he told me at that point, he hadn't wanted to share it earlier, that he had been to all the best doctors in the country and nobody could tell him anything. They didn't know anyone who had survived this much severe brain damage. But finally he got to the Mayo Clinic and they told him that there was nothing he could expect except for me to be a vegetable the mm. rest of my life. Unbelievable. Thanks so for adding that. So he decided that. to let me see whatever I could do to recover because he knew that the doctors really didn't have much hope for me. They should see you now. In your walk with Baba since then, have you ever inquired, have you ever asked, or just put it out there to the universe, why so many traumatic experiences befell such a young woman, starting from the age of five, six, and then through your teen years, uh, challenging your own spiritual belief, your own belief in yourself, your own self-identity. Uh, and, and yet you've come through it. Many don't, I'm guessing, but you came through it. You came through it in a most miraculous way, it seems to me. You reached out at the right time to the correct doctor. <laughs> God, if you exist, help me now. You know, I, need, I need some attention. Mm -hmm. and. It just seems so unfair. I mean, I'm sure it's unfair for anybody to have to endure this, but especially for young people who don't know really how to turn it around to begin the road towards recovery. Mental health issues in this society are severely stigmatized. They're invisible. Nobody sees that kind of suffering, and yet it's all around us. Uh, Massive brain damage is something that just gets shunted away into institutions or hospitals. At that time, there was no uh, recovery units. There was no rehabilitation programs. People didn't recover from massive head injuries and automobile accidents. Um, they didn't have MRIs or CAT scans. They probably weren't even properly diagnosed. They People just died. They didn't know how to keep people alive who had that mm -hmm. kind of brain damage. Chemical brain damage is less common. You know, the type I had had global implications, which is true for most massive head injuries. It's global. You may have a frontal head injury, but the brain is, mm -hmm. is in a fluid medium, and it bounces against the back of the skull, and it bounces back and forth, and, it be, and the, the synapses, the connections between neurons get shattered no matter what. Mm -hmm. So traumatic head injuries and the kind of brain damage that I have have a lot in common. And it's an invisible thing. Right now we have, for example, a lot of veterans who are coming back from the wars who have traumatic head injuries. And it's, it's very hard to recover, but there's a lot more strategies to recover now than there mm -hmm. used to be. By the time I had been about 10 years, of figuring out on my own how to recover. I read that meditation helps the left and right hemispheres of the brain synchronize in their um, brain waves, which helps with learning. 
Um, so I meditated a lot. I learned that uh, NLP um, uses many sensory modalities for learning. I was severely learning disabled, so even as I recovered very gradually, I still was very handicapped. So I learned what it was like to be uh, mentally retarded in this society, to not understand other people's language or concepts. Supposedly, I'd been to read, but at that point, I, I didn't make any difference. It didn't make any difference, and I was—I didn't understand what people around me were saying. You touched upon something very important that it's be perhaps one of the longest s stigmas in our culture, and still is there. I mean, I remember reporting on mental challenges, mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar disorders, everything, mm -hmm. 40 years ago, as being stigmatized. Mm -hmm. But 30 years. Oh, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, it was still the same problem, and you're saying today it's still the same problem. And we're talking about it within the context of a side devotee surrounded by presumably other loving side devotees. I'm just going to reach out and ask you to comment on this. Everybody's trying to grow closer to God as they see it within the Psi organization, within the Psi fold, let's say. But it's so easy to make judgments on other people's perhaps conditions that aren't seen, and you used that term before, you can't see a mental illness, for example. Mm -hmm. So it's so easy to make a judgment because it has been stigmatized for so long. Does it, do you find it curious that it still goes on, even among Psy devotees, presumably? I don't find it curious at all. When people have really impaired social skills, they can't relate, maybe they can't make eye contact, they can't say anything that is a normal response in a conversation. It's very disturbing to people who have an expectation of a normal response, which is what they need in order to interact socially. So people who lack social skills or are, un or are completely unable to engage mm -hmm. in what is considered normal ways are it's distressing to people around them. It's been distressing to people around me, and I recognize that. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy thing to put up with when somebody is not able to focus or is very, very changeable or is completely irrational. Or, or you know, these are not things that are easy for people to adapt to. So, and I would, I would imagine. So I, I don't, I have compassion for people who don't who can't handle it i just i realize they have low tolerance for um for for handling change themselves <coughs> mm -hmm. i would imagine it's <laughs> made even worse when pers when a person with these severe challenges are also going through a severe spiritual challenge i mean you've got two enormous equations going on that to an outsider who's just meeting that individual may leave them lost in knowing how to even react, as you say, mm -hmm. around somebody like this. This is a great topic to focus on for this soldiers. And I'd appreciate it if we could just talk a little bit more about how, you know, Baba has said, and I've learned from the Course in Miracles, that everything is always perfect. Uh, everything is as it should be to build you to your highest and best self. In fact, it's required that we go through these hoops, mm -hmm. some very painful. Your hoops have been enormously complex. Uh, do you understand why some individuals seem to have more challenges than others to get to the person they're destined to become? I mean, your path has unfolded along the side route so beautifully. Have you put all of that together, or do you still have areas of concern? Everything that happens to us is a gift. So these things that we see as challenges are there for us to grow from. It's very hard to say that to someone who is suffering from what in our society or culture is considered to be an incurable disease. And so that's not said without tremendous compassion because the suffering is terrible. And everything is a gift. There is nothing that isn't, but it takes a lot of tremendous amount of digging and deep work to reframe it as a gift and to, to understand how we grow from it. And sometimes we have to die before we can accept that gift. You know, I don't, and that's not the worst thing that can happen, but it may seem to be for many people. 
you, I, you, and you mean die in every context. I mean letting go of this body. Mm -hmm. But we are all in a process of evolution, and the evolution is towards recognizing that we are not separate from God, that there is no difference. And we are all on that path. Mm -hmm. Every single one of us, even people who are not in the sci fold, people of all religions and faiths, people of no faith, we are all here. This, this, this mess that we're in, this apparent mess of this world, is just an opportunity to experience whatever we experience. You mm -hmm. know, the Buddhists have a saying that uh, pain is inevitable, uh, but suffering is optional. Mm -hmm. You can choose. Which means, and for some people, they don't feel that they can choose. So again, it's not to negate that suffering. Well, if suffering. you don't know that that choice exists, you can't choose. Or if you don't have the skills or resources. Most of my life, I didn't have any inner resources to, to deal with the things that were happening to me. So that takes a lot of, you know, I'm now 62, okay, so I even now, I'm still continuing to make gains. In 2005, a teacher came to me who said, Rosie, you're not brain damaged. You have no, you ha what you have is just ordinary. You think you're so exceptional, <laughs> you know? Stop thinking of being so exceptional. You're not so special. It's just like anyone else. And he taught me to have an awareness through the body of what I was feeling and to have it in the moment. At that time, I would still have an emotional reaction to something, but I wouldn't know what it was until maybe 12 hours later. And I would stay up all night processing an event that had happened during the day. And it took enormous amounts of time because it was so distressing to me. But I started paying attention to small signals in my body so that I could learn to read what it was that I was feeling and respond appropriately in the moment. And this has led to a tremendous amount of inner peace, just having the emotional component and being able to be authentic with it. I'm and this has led to my current, you know, I'm like, you know, as a massage therapist, you know, this is, I'm starting to fulfill that prayer that I prayed for so many years, please let this not, this suffering not be wasted mm -hmm. so that I can give I can teach, I can offer whatever I have learned in some way to be of service to others. I think we all have blocks in our lives, dark holes, black holes. Yes. Uh, they can be very, very different from one another. What you're talking about, I, I believe, is very, very important, especially as a soldier in this interview, because all another person has to do hearing your account is to think about what's their stumbling block, what's their brick wall, mm. and, and how so what if it's a wall? Don't define yourself that way. That's not who you are. That's not the special um, obstacle that's, that can or should limit you from your fullest potential. Mm -hmm. you know, choose to go under it, around it, or through it, or whatever the case may be, much like you have. So I, I, I'm very happy that this conversation has turned the way it did. And we're over 40 minutes now, so as we start to wind down, uh, if it's all right with you, I'd like to ask how it enriched your relationship with Sai Baba. Had you been over to India to see him? How much is he still vividly a part of your life? And what do you make of who Sai Baba is? And think as if you're speaking to your parents, your aunts and uncles, your neighbors, your friends who know nothing about and have no interest in Sai Baba, but it's because of, who knows, the path they're on and that your answer might be informative to, to another person seeing this who's interested in Baba. I've been to India to see Swami eight times. Um, I was graced by living with Wilma and Ivan Bronchi for 20 years. You lived with them for 20 years. Let's see. I was her secretary for 20 I have to calculate this. Swami, okay, so I moved there in 1988 and I left in 2002. Okay, so almost 20 years. 14 years. 14 years. 14 years. I was her secretary for 22 okay. years. Okay, that's where that came yeah. in. I have to calculate sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, with, with brain damage, it's like there's all kinds of memory things and challenges with speech still, mm -hmm. you know. So there's 
challenges with organizing and time and I still don't know how long it takes to do stuff and right now I'm I'm like I'm going through a phase with Swami where I don't know how to do a thing I am I'm so gifted by sojourns in one of your interviews with Seema Dewan mm -hmm. that has stayed with me forever which is she said I try not to think and I go <laughs> yeah, you know, thinking is kind of a waste of time. If I just offer everything to Swami and then just keep asking, well, what am I doing now? What am I doing now? Then there doesn't have to be any thinking. And it, it reminds me of a recent comment that was given to me yet again, because he gave it to me many times before, but it finally started to sink in from Al Drucker. And I had the privilege to interview him for a second and third time a year ago. First time was at uh, Wilma's farmhouse there in, mm -hmm. in Grants Pass, Oregon many years ago. And he said, Ted, it's, the time is running through our fingers. Uh, we're working too hard. You need to give up the thinking part of it. No longer attempt to become anything, Ted. Mm -hmm. Just be. Yes. Don't become. Be. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what Seema would say. Yes. If you're not thinking, you're just being. That's <laughs> right. That's right. And it's so much easier. Everything flows better. So sweet. You don't have to. It's like even just offering your actions to God, they're no longer your actions. There's yeah. nothing but God. So you just are like a, a little part of the flow of the river of God. There mm -hmm. isn't a difference. It's so sweet. Yeah. You don't even have to take on the responsibility, responsibility any longer in life of how well you're praying mm -hmm. if you just be, if you stop the thinking part and mm -hmm. just exist. Your life is a prayer. Yes. So, Baba, the the trips you have made over to India, the time you spent with the Bronchies, um, all of this has helped shape who you have become today, as a as a spiritual being. There can't be anything else. Everything that we have done or that we have experienced, as if we are separate, shapes who we are as spiritual beings. Everything, good, bad, and different. So, you were asking about trips to India. Uh, most of the first trips that I went there, I was an absolute mess. By the time I landed in Mother Bronchi's lap, I was really in bad shape. And I had a long rehabilitation process. Um, possibly because we're out of time, I'll just talk about, you know, one of the most significant ones. Mm -hmm. um, okay, the only one that comes to me at this point is... Um, a trip that uh, I made with Mother Bronchi initially and then stayed on longer. Let me think, is that right? No, the trip that I made on my own, okay. Okay. Um, and I was there for three months, and at that time I had epilepsy. And uh, we were staying. And there were many ways of getting there, and Swami would answer all the questions and direct every part of how I was to go, when I was to go, where I was to go, everything. So I had very, really wonderful uh, roommates uh, who were from all other countries and who spoke a little bit of English, mostly uh, from Italy and Peru and France. And at this time we were staying at Vrindavan, at the guest house. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I was having seizures, and I would have seizures every darshan. And I said, Swami, I cannot love you without having a seizure. You are God, and you must do something about this, because I don't want to stop loving you. You are God. You must do something about this. This is impossible for me to love you and have a seizure. That's impossible. So Swami said, you need to do some seva. At that time, the seva dolls in front of the guest house had been attacked by an Indian man with a knife, so they were asking Westerners to volunteer. Ooh. So I volunteered to sit on the steps with the Indian seva dolls. And, um, you know, the, they didn't speak much English. They saw that I had psoriasis, and they said, ah, Ayurvedic lady doctor, and I thought to myself, oh sure, another person who can <laughs> cure psoriasis. Uh, I'm not really so interested, but I was polite to them. And then, you know, I would sit on the steps with them a lot because there weren't other Westerners who'd volunteered, so I would sit with them all the time. And then 
came one time that I had a seizure while I was sitting on the steps and they were so concerned and I said, epilepsy. And they said, ah, Ayurvedic lady doctor, epilepsy doctor, Ayurvedic lady doctor, <laughs> epilepsy doctor. So they took me to her and this is Bhavani Ma and her family had been given a gift 2,000 years ago of healing and it had been passed on in her family from one generation to the next all this time. And she had been curing people of epilepsy since she was 14 years old. So she gave me this uh, ginger medicine for epilepsy that was so hot my ears would pop up. That's mm -hmm. okay. But, you know, it's just like Swami knew that he was supposed to cure me <coughs> of epilepsy. So um, this stayed, so the epilepsy stayed in remission for a few years and then it came back and I went on another trip with Wilma and we went to uh, the Philippines and I had psychic surgery for some brain tumors mm -hmm. uh, which diminished the seizures quite a bit but then I still was severely handicapped by the seizures I was having I don't remember I guess it went down from 18 a week to 9 a week which is still a lot of seizures and I had, when we had been in India, <coughs> I had prayed to Swami and he turned around and showed his hands behind his back and said, with these two hands, I will help you. So there I was back in Grant's Pass and some people were praying for me and I felt a hand reaching inside my brain and untwisting a knot. And I went home and I was scheduled at that point for another MRI because they were considering doing surgery to cut the corpus callosum, which they do for intractable. I was also medically intractable. None of the medications could help. And um, so I was scheduled the next day and I woke up that morning and there was this flood of energy going through the right side of my head. And I said, Swami, if this is you and you are curing me of epilepsy, then let the MRI show something that nobody else knows, which is, you know, I'd had scans of my brain that showed that it had been very shrunken, which mm -hmm. is typical for people many years after they've recovered from massive brain damage. The, the cells that have died slough off, and so there was this huge gap. So I said, Swami, you know, if this is really you and you're curing me of epilepsy, let my brain be returned to normal size. So in fact, that's what happened with the MRI. So I knew that it was Swami. And there was this gap where Swami had removed the focal lesion of the epilepsy. So, um, other trips to India, Swami would train me to listen with my heart. Now, I know I talked about NLP and mm -hmm. brain waves. Heart entrainment, there's many, many neurons in the heart. And so it's one of the ways that I recovered from the brain damage was by listening with my heart. And, I kn and, you know, there's so many neurons in the heart that it's possible for the brain to learn to see and understand through the heart's perception. Now, some people may think, oh, this is pseudoscience. But I remember one very powerful video of Swami in <coughs> which he was talking about EHV. And he was talking about... Um, and he was saying thinking and he gestured to the heart, you know, and he was talking about speaking and acting and thinking and he gestured to the heart for thinking and he was saying, what was it? Heart, hand, and I can't remember, but mm -hmm. anyway. Um, so it reinforced. It reinforced that you can learn from the heart and that that is a way of understanding what is true and what isn't. Mm -hmm. With the brain damage I had, I had very poor discrimination. I couldn't tell right, I could tell right from wrong, but I, I couldn't tell a bad person from a good person. I didn't know what to do most of the time. And, it, and I didn't know whether when I was listening to Swami, it was really my own head or strange voices that would drift in and out of my head or if it was Swami and he taught me to listen to him with my heart and that in darshan he trained me over and over and over so that I would know when I was really hearing him was that I was looking at him with the third eye and I could feel the love for him in my heart 
And then if there were words that came, I knew it was from him. And he taught me that by looking at me in darshan whenever I would do what he was instructing. And he trained me over and over and over so that I could really hear with my heart. Rosie, I think uh, this, this program, this interview has contained, it contains within it many important points that I want to leave as they are as, and underscore them the best I can. And, and yet I think that last point that you're talking about, sort of exiting your head a little bit in order to take up residency more in your heart for all the reasons you just said is such an important lesson too and it came right from Baba uh, as you explained. The last question and people always kid me because I ask it so often but I'm always curious to know how different the answers become. Who is Baba to you? And the only answer that comes is, what is Baba not? There is nothing that isn't Baba. I don't know how to answer that. Who isn't Baba? How isn't Baba? When isn't Baba? Where isn't Baba? Why isn't Baba? Is that? <laughs> That's the best that I can say. <laughs> I, I think you get an A with that answer. Rosie Goldsmith, uh, here in beautiful Portland where it happens to be a cloudy day and you have to put up with me with a bad cold. Thank you so much. It's been really another wonderful lesson. I hope others profit from it as much as I do. You hit some extremely important points that I needed to hear today and I suspect others did too. Thank you. Saira. Saira. <laughs>